but you go down to the to where we are now, and I do feel like Embiid, Booker, Mitchell, Luca, Simmons, Trey are Young, we Tate. Simmons. We putting Simmons. Well, I'm, I'm in just there? I'm throwing out the modern oh, okay. young stars. Okay. okay, Simmons, Trey Young, Tatum, Jokic. They feel like a kind of a, for lack of a better word, an extended class. Right. Of like, oh, this feels like now an era to me. And even though Embiid was drafted in 14 and so was Jokic, like they didn't really become what right. they became until the latter half of the decade. And now it feels like that's the generation that's going to carry this league for better and worse after the previous guys start to get old. Yeah, 100%. And I think this season is the proof of that. Uh, when Jokic has been on the floor and Embiid has been on the floor, these have been legitimate MVP level seasons. And, you know, I was on group chat earlier and I, and I don't want to throw Derrick Rose under the bus, but Jokic's season is not Derrick Rose in 2011. This is legitimate MVP level play. Like this guy is playing at a level of some of the greatest bigs in the game. And I think Embiid has actually even been better. When he's yeah. been on the floor, he's just happened to um, miss a bunch of games. And so the proof is in the pudding. These guys are playing at dominant MVP level. And, you know, Jokic, I think people are talking about, oh, I want to see it in the playoffs. I'm sorry. I saw it in the playoffs last year. He whooped the Clippers up and down that damn court. Two years. He both play both <laughs> postseasons. He's been awesome. He's like 26 and 14 yeah. in the playoffs, something like that. So he's there, you know, um, Jokic is there. And you mentioned Murray. It's unfortunate what happened with the injury because, you know, once they traded for Gordon and the way that thing was gelling, I was like, whoa, yeah, this is going to be pretty freaking scary in the playoffs as in like they can legitimately beat the Lakers and the Clippers out West. They can beat anybody they play in the finals. Now that Murray got hurt, the, a little bit of luster has been taken off because they don't have, really have the perimeter one-on-one creation anymore because I don't think Porter Jr. is at that level of playoff one-on-one shot creation. But yeah, Jokic and Embiid are 100% just as good and dominant in the big spots as anybody else. And I think Giannis even though he is 2013 draft, I think he kind of gets shoehorned with this generation Yeah. versus like the, the generation before was, was Anthony Davis, Dame, Kyrie, Clay, Kawhi, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, which is basically like in three drafts, you get all those guys. Right. Giannis is in that draft. I don't feel like he's in that. I feel like he's like, I look at this and it's basically Embiid, Jokic, Luka and Giannis leading the way. And what do those four guys have in common? Right. None of them are American players. Right. And right. they're and all uni- kind of unicorny in their own way. And the only guy missing is Porzingis, who, you know, had bad luck yeah. with injuries, but he would have been in there too. 100%. And Giannis, why I think you got to say, you got to extend him out. He was playing in the YMCA league in Greece, right? Like he had yeah. a long developmental curve, even right. when he got drafted. He was young and the level of competition just wasn't there. But his rise, you can see every single year he's adding, 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 getting better and better. His body is getting more developed into where he is now, you know, a dominant player in the league. But yeah, I would agree with you. I think Giannis, even though he got drafted at the same time as them, his developmental sort of, uh, clock, if you will, started a little bit later, which, you know, which is to be expected when he was playing against a bunch of mechanics in Greece. So I wonder, out of that group, who has the chance to kind of own that generation? So again, if we go Embiid and Giannis and Jokic and Luka is like the kind of the the highest level, and then you go next level would be the Booker, Mitchell, Tatum, all those dudes. Ultimately, remember, like, we're going to remember the the marquee, the best guys. We're going to remember LeBron and and Kareem and you, Bill Russell. He owned his generation and going down the line. I wonder who would you bet on out of those four that will look back 10 years from now? Because my bet would be Luca, just because I think he's the safest bet of the four. Yeah, so for me, if we're not counting injury luck in all of this, because I think obviously injury sort of always looms very large over Joel Embiid's, you know, head, but, right? But I think that has to factor in the decision, though, because you're betting on right. who do I think 10 years from now are going to remember the most, and he's the least safe bet because I don't know how many games he's going to play. Right, but at the same time, he's the only one who I know can be dominant on both ends, right? right. Like, he's my one-man defense and one-man offense. He's the only one of that group who you can actually say that about, right? So I think... 
If I wasn't counting the injuries, I'd definitely go with Embiid because I just think he makes you top five in defense by showing up. And offensively, you cannot cover him with one guy, period. And he's now made his game efficient at all three levels, whether it be low post, mid-range, and out to three, right? So that, like, to me, that combination is the most special of the th- of all of them because of what he does defensively. But that being said, Luca has the freaking ball in his hand all the time. And it's hard for me to not remember what he did to the Clippers last year in the playoffs, where it's like the two scariest wing defenders in the NBA on one team. And Luca was like, give me the ball. They can't do shit with me. So Brett. I think Luca's going to be the one that ultimately stamps his name on the league in such a way. Because again, you can't stop him from scoring and playmaking. He's a generational playmaker. Yeah, it's funny. You know, he gets compared to a bunch of different guys from the past, and Bird is one of them because of his ability to score and do a playmake, all the different things. Oh, I but, thought it was I thought it was the hair. Well, he might be, <laughs> might be that too. Uh, <laughs> uh, from a personality standpoint, he's very young Birdish. Mm-hmm. First mm-hmm. five years, Bird was not exactly a stand up comedian, <laughs> and. I would say Luca is not either. <laughs> the one who has the personality is Embiid. Yeah. And he's the one that, um, you know, it's funny that he wasn't born here because he feels like the most yeah. American of all these mm-hmm. dudes and the way he uses social media and his interviews and the way he fucks with people, like really reminds me of Shaq. Like a lot of the stuff he does and his Facts. dismissiveness with rivals and the fact that like, there's certain people he just hates and he's like, I'm going to destroy Andre Drummond tonight. <laughs> I, he yeah. just bothers me. I'm gonna, like that's the kind of shit Shaq did. Right. So I think it would be the most fun if Embiid became the guy. Yeah. But I just I'm with you. I worry about the durability stuff. Yeah, and you know, and Luca right now, I think one he doesn't feel as comfortable with English as Embiid clearly does. Right. Like yep. Embiid understands American English and American humor. Like he gets the tone of American. It's really humor. weird, isn't it? It's, I don't it's understand insane. it. It's insane. It's insane because you know, like my parents are immigrants, right? Like they're immigrants from Haiti, so there's a certain Haitian sense of humor and sensibility that I understand because I grew up in that. But I also, you know, in American pop culture, that like that's what is more native to me, right? But Joel and Bead, like completely understands American humor, American culture, how it is you're supposed to go at somebody in an online platform versus how you do it in front of a bunch of reporters, in front of a crowd. Like, he just has a facility with how to communicate that um, is just, you know, nobody else can compete. And I just think Luca. I don't think he feels comfortable in that role, being the 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 sort of holding court, being the focal point of attention. I don't think he he feels comfortable with his English yet, but I think he might get there. Uh, but right. yeah, like you said, uh, Joel is he's he's got it all. Luca Dirk was the same way. We didn't hear from Dirk for years, right? And then Dirk slowly became like this kind of stealth funny guy. Yeah. Um, the Jokic thing, that that one, I. I I don't know why the passing hasn't caught on in a more fun way, especially with the way social media works and just how brilliant he is as a passer. The the, the amount of disrespect for the season he had, which you mentioned earlier, like I, it's been really weird to me. I don't understand why people don't aren't like bowing at the altar of this crazy season he's having. It's like they're suspicious of it. I have a theory. Of it. I, have a theory. It? I, I, it's, I gotta bring it back to like 2015, 2016, um, when Steph was getting all the praise, right? And I can tell you, like, as a black dude, and Steph is black, but the way in which the media was fawning over Steph, I don't know why, it made me feel uncomfortable. It was, there was just something, like, the amount of times I heard media members call Steph Curry relatable. Made me feel weird. Like white dudes just say, the guy's just so relatable. He's just so relatable, Bill. I'm like, damn, Chris Paul wasn't relatable. You know, like, <laughs> like the, the dudes before wasn't relatable. There was just something strange. It was something, it just gave people a weird feeling. And I think, unfortunately, 
the same thing is happening with Jokic. I think people are suspicious of this idea of like, oh, this big doughy white guy who has all the fundamentals down pat and is a great passer and playmaker and all of that. I think people are suspicious of it. Mm. But, you know, and I can admit to my own suspicions of Jokic. I used to call him Jokic because I just refused to say his name right. I was like, first of all, <laughs> you better play some defense as a center before I start saying your name right. Um, But, you know, I, I, I shed all of that once I watched him in the playoffs and you realize – Nobody can guard this guy one-on-one. You literally can't put a single guy on him. And once you send two, he's picking you apart. Like, this guy is the most unstoppable weapon. And, like, to me, in crunch time, specifically when the game is tight, he's the best crunch time player in the league, in my opinion. Like, he can carve you up however you want. Um, He can do it from the elbow. If you want to try to switch some little puny little guard on him, he's going to put him underneath the freaking basket. He has pick and pop ability. He can – They. I've watched him ISO, where he just takes dudes off the dribble, does his little spin move, soundboard shuffle. I'm like – and then again, if you send help, he is going to pick your ass apart. This is the most lethal offensive weapon in the clutch that we have in today's game. I just think people honestly haven't watched it in the right spots. Uh, even against the Lakers, there was that game where AD guarded him down the stretch. And AD is, to me, when he's on the best defender in the league, right? Because and the best guy to guard Jokic, too. Right, because he's so long, he's so quick, he can bother him in so many ways. And Jokic is like, all right, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to freaking put my body on him to back him up, and I'm going to get my little jump hook off, right? I just think people are skeptical of the way the praise happened for Jokic with all of the passing and all the beautiful game. And, you know, a certain amount of people start getting behind that, and other people start lifting their eyebrows. Like, I think Steph is still suffering from that. I think why you see players don't gravitate towards giving Steph the love. I think he's getting it now, finally. But when it was happening in 2015, I think a lot of players felt like, oh, the, he's a family man. Like, this is the first family man, the first Christian. It's just like, it was just so strange, the effusive praise that Steph got for being... His parents come that, to the game. Right. <laughs> he's, exactly. He's got parents of... Like, like, there was nothing really that special about... All the other stuff that wasn't how great he was on the court, but it kept coming up. And I think people responded to be like, man, this feels weird. But he's getting his love now, so it was good. And I think yeah. Jokic will eventually, too. The Curry thing started out as a 100% genuine thing, and I agree. It probably went a little sideways. There might have been a little LeBron fatigue, too. People just yeah. trying to yeah. jump on who the next guy was, all that stuff. You made a good point with Jokic about the crunch time stuff. I think I trust him more in crunch time than anyone with the possible exception of Durant. And I'm going to judge it by this way. When he has the ball and they need a basket, I'm surprised when he doesn't get the basket. Like if you're just measuring by that, like who is the most surprising when they don't come through with 50 seconds left? He's number one for me. And I think Durant's number two, if Durant's healthy. Yeah. And it's so crazy because he's their center. And right. we're not used to watching crunch time plays being called for centers. But again, this guy can attack from 25 feet out. He's not going to do it in the traditional wing way. He'll just straight up back you down, start from out there. And again, if you try to send somebody, he's going to pick you apart. And I've watched him make so many clutch baskets in the last over the last three seasons to the point where I'm just like, this is just what he's going to do. He's going to get big buckets in big moments every single time. And so, yeah, I, and again, in the playoffs, I think, you know, he used to be a really, really bad defender, and now he's fine, you know, especially around the rim. He's, he's like, frisky. He, he tries. Exactly. He has quick hands, all of that. So he's not a complete sieve, but we'll see in the playoffs if the right teams target him and make it a problem for Denver. We're going to take a quick break, and then I want to ask you about your least favorite players. This episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Great teams start with great talent, but finding the right people can be a challenge, especially if you're a business owner who's hiring. Look, look at the NFL right now. Imagine the Patriots trying to rebuild their crappy team. What'd they do? They spent a lot of money in free agency. They kept their draft picks, tried to do some moves there, and tried to rebuild things on the fly. It's really hard. Well, when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job boards with one click. And ZipRecruiter is so effective. 
that four to five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So while other companies overwhelm you with way too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you what you're looking for. The needle in the haystack. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. Once again, ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. All right, we're back. Um, we just praised a bunch of guys. <laughs> um, you've been known to give your opinion from time to time. <laughs> who, who rubs you the wrong way? Which, 